Greetings, Embers, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, those links can be found down below. Also, if you are new here and enjoy what you are hearing or have been here and haven't done so already, please remember to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help the channel out, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Crime Cases Volume 9. Right after this intro, there will be an ad, and before I read the first case, there will be an ad. After that, there will be no more ads within this video. Chadwick Banks executed for the murders of his wife, Cassandra Banks, and her 10-year-old daughter, Melody Cooper. Chadwick Banks was put to death for the murders of his wife, Cassandra Banks, and his 10-year-old stepdaughter, Melody Cooper, whose bodies were found inside their home in Gadsden County, Florida. In 1991, Cassandra met Chadwick through her uncle, who worked with him at the Fiberstone Quarries, where they built doors and fireplace frames. About a year later, on July 27, 1992, they were married. It was Cassandra's second marriage and Chadwick's first. They lived together in a two-bedroom mobile home in Quincy, about 20 miles west of Tallahassee, with Cassandra's daughter. Melody was a fifth-grade student at George W. Monroe Elementary School, and she wasn't too fond of Chadwick, which is why she didn't want to go to their wedding, according to the Tallahassee Democrat. It was reported that relatives thought Melody was jealous of the new man in her mother's life, but they uncovered that there was another explanation for her abhorrence for Chadwick. Several of Melody's friends told detectives that she told them that her stepdaddy was messing with her in a sexual way, and she told them to remain tight-lipped about it. They obliged, but they broke their promise after she was murdered. On the morning of September 24, 1992, Melody and her mother were found dead inside their home. Cassandra, who had turned 30 five days earlier, was still in her bed, and her daughter was found on her knees slumped over her bed. Melody was naked from the waist down. The following day, Chadwick confessed to the murders after he was arrested at his job. He was booked into the Gadsden County Jail on charges of two counts of first-degree murder and one count of sexual battery on a child under 12. Chadwick was already on probation for two aggravated assault charges. An investigation revealed that the night before the murders, Cassandra went to Dutt's place where Chadwick, who was 21 years old at the time, was playing pool. Shortly before 2 a.m. on September 24, 1992, witnesses saw them arguing outside of the pool hall. Cassandra headed home shortly thereafter, and within an hour, Chadwick followed suit. When he arrived, authorities said he went into the bedroom where his wife was sleeping and shot her in the head with a 32 caliber revolver. He then went to Melody's bedroom and sexually assaulted her before shooting her in the head. The St. Lucie News Tribune reported that Chadwick told detectives that he spanked Melody and molested her for 20 minutes, but she didn't resist or try to get away. It turned out, however, that the assault was far more violent than he described. Melody was sodomized and had Chadwick's blood under her fingernails as well as on her pillows. She sustained bruising and a cut on her face during the assault. Chadwick's DNA was also found inside Melody. Expert testified that Melody was shot at the top of her skull, which indicated to them that, after the assault, he pulled her head back and opened fire. After the murder, Chadwick went to a relative's house where he hid the gun and slept for several hours before heading into work. 
An officer with the Quincy Police Department stated in 1992 that it was one of the most gruesome things that happened in the community that had everyone in shock. It was a small town and a huge case. They just couldn't believe such a thing could happen in a small town. Chadwick pleaded no contest to the crimes and he claimed that he was drunk at the time. During the trial, the court stated that Chadwick bought between five and seven 16 ounce malt liquors while he was at the bar within four to six hours before the murders occurred. Prosecutors stated that drunkenness was not recognized by law as a mitigating factor, and they also noted that Chadwick was able to drive home and let himself inside. In 1994, a Gadsden County jury found Chadwick guilty and recommended the death penalty. The judge approved and later sentenced him to death. Chadwick made two attempts to appeal his sentence, but they were denied by the Florida Supreme Court. The court then called the murders of Cassandra and Melody heinous, atrocious, and cruel, which they said was enough to warrant death. Several weeks before Chadwick was put to death, his attorney submitted a stay of execution, claiming that his post-conviction counsel did not have the resources, staff, or experience to take on capital litigation. The stay of execution was denied. Chadwick apologized to the victim's families for hurting and disappointing them for many years. He said, quote, Year after year, I have tried to come up with a reasonable answer to my actions, but how could such acts be reasonable? On the morning of his execution, November 13, 2014, Chadwick ordered his last meal, fried fish, hush puppies, french fries with banana pudding, red velvet cake, and butter pecan ice cream as his dessert. He also requested iced water. At 7.27 p.m., Chadwick was pronounced dead after being executed by lethal injection at Florida State Prison in Stark. He was 43 years old. Jerry Lynn Burns, behind bars for the cold case murder of 18-year-old Michelle Martinko. Jerry Lynn Burns is behind bars for the murder of Michelle Martinko, whose body was found inside a vehicle that was parked behind a mall in southwest Cedar Rapids, Iowa. On December 19, 1979, Martinko, who was an 18-year-old senior at John F. Kennedy High School, used her parents' vehicle, a tan 1972 Buick, to attend a school event at the Sheraton Inn, according to the Des Moines Tribute. She later called them and said she was going to go to the Westdale Mall to pick up a coat that had been put on layaway. She was going to head home afterward, but she never arrived. Her friend said they last saw her at the shopping mall at around 8 p.m., and they had no idea what happened to her after that. One witness claims to have seen her shopping in a jewelry store. At around 2 a.m. on December 20th, 1979, Martinko's parents called the Cedar Rapids Police Department and reported her missing, which prompted a search by law enforcement. Two hours later, Martinko was found dead. When a police officer went to the shopping mall, he spotted Martinko's family vehicle parked behind J.C. Penney. Upon looking inside, he found Martinko's body in the passenger seat. According to the pathologist's testimony, Martinko was stabbed 29 times in the face and chest, but the fatal wound was to her sternum, which penetrated her aorta, and she bled to death. Martinko also had defensive wounds on her hands. A preliminary investigation showed that Martinko died at around 9 p.m. the previous evening. After searching the vehicle, investigators realized that Martinko's killer tried to conceal his identity by using rubber gloves. 
they found a print in the dirt on the outside of the vehicle, as well as a print in blood inside. What the killer didn't anticipate was leaving behind his own blood on the gear shift as well as the black dress Martinko was wearing. However, police officials weren't able to identify Martinko's killer. They initially suspected Martinko's ex-boyfriend, but he was cleared after having his DNA tested. We're talking to friends and two or teachers, but so far we have no leads, Chief Ray Baker said in 1979. We're hoping somebody saw something or knows something that will be of assistance to us. On March 19, 2018, nearly 40 years after Martinko was killed, Burns, who was 66, was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. He was booked into the Lynn County Jail where he was held on a $5 million cash bond only. During an interrogation, Burns denied having anything to do with Martinko's murder. Yet he was unable to explain how his DNA got inside her family's vehicle. He said, if I was there, I don't know. As far as I know, I was not there. Then he told the detective to test his DNA to see if it was a match, but they had already collected his DNA from a straw he left behind at a restaurant. After finding Martinko's killer, detectives tried to figure out the motive. They had already ruled out robbery as $180 was found inside her purse and she wasn't sexually assaulted. When the detective asked Burns why he killed Martinko, he said, We've got to prove I was there first. In a statement, Burns' family said, The charge against Jerry comes as a complete shock to us, and we are doing our best to carry on with our lives. During this difficult time, and as the justice system runs its course, we ask that our privacy be respected. The family of Jerry Burns would like to thank our friends and the Manchester community for the support we have received since Jerry's arrest. We would also like to extend our sympathy to the Martinko family. In February 2020, a jury deliberated for three hours before finding Burns, who reportedly showed no emotion during the trial, guilty of first-degree murder. That same year, in August, Burns was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. After his sentencing, he said, Somebody else killed Martinko that night. Burns then turned to his family and thanked them for supporting him. First Assistant Lynn County Attorney Nick Maybanks said, Mr. Burns will have the rest of his life to ask for forgiveness and beg for mercy on his soul. But if he doesn't, at least he won't get to block it out anymore. Because this moment has finally come. This is the moment of reckoning for him and the moment long awaited, of resting peace for Michelle. He later filed an appeal after his attorneys contended that investigators violated the Constitution when they collected the DNA from his straw. Despite their claims, the appeal was denied. Burns is serving his sentence at Anamosa State Penitentiary in Anamosa, Iowa. Author Jensen behind bars for murdering a 17-year-old girl, Adria Bunn, who went to his home to buy Disney Cubs. Author Jensen is behind bars for murdering a 17-year-old girl, Adaria Bunn, also known as Sissy, at his home in Sheldon, Illinois. At 4.13 p.m. on August 5, 2019, law enforcement officers were dispatched to a home in the 300 block of West Main Street after receiving a 911 call from a neighbor about a disturbance. They claimed to have heard a young girl screaming from inside the house. She was yelling, stop, let me go, and I won't tell the police if you just let me go, according to NBC Chicago. When officers arrived on the scene, they found Jensen outside his home, where the then 49-year-old told them, there's a girl inside, and I strangled her. 
Police officials found Adria's body inside the home, and an autopsy later confirmed that she died from ligature strangulation. Jensen was immediately arrested and charged with first-degree murder. He was booked into the Iroquois County Jail, where he was held on a $1 million bond. Adara was a straight-A student at Milford High School, where she was about to start her junior year. The aspiring veterinarian lived in Sheldon with her family. An investigation revealed that three days before Adara was murdered, she attended a neighborhood-wide rummage sale with her mother. The mother and daughter made a stop at Jensen's home, where Adara purchased Pocahontas glasses. She was a collector of Disney memorabilia. On August 4, 2015, Adara returned to Jensen's house, wanting to speak to his wife about buying more memorabilia items. But she wasn't home. She was at her high school reunion out of town. As Jensen and a friend were cleaning up from a previous yard sale, he told Adara to come back tomorrow. He claimed that he would have Disney cups available for her to buy. When Adara returned to Jensen's home the following day, he strangled her to death with a blue nylon rope, and investigators believe that Jensen lured Adara to her death. According to Adara's obituary, she enjoyed reading, fishing, school, amongst other things. She was an all-around joy to everyone around her. In a statement, the Milford Area Public School stated that the community is grieving after hearing of the death of one of our high school students yesterday. We are suffering as a staff, student body, and community for this loss. Please keep the family of our student in your thoughts and prayers during this terrible time. Assistant State's Attorney Michael Quinlan said that it was one of the worst murder cases he had ever seen. Jensen's attorney didn't deny he killed Adara, but he contested the first-degree murder charge. He claimed that Jensen had no knowledge that the teen was going to stop by his home. When she showed up, they spoke briefly outside before Jensen went back inside his house. As he exited the bathroom, Jensen's attorney stated that he was startled when he saw Adara standing in his living room area. He said he tried to physically remove Adara from his home, but during the struggle, he became enraged and pulled the rope from his pocket, which he said he had because he had been packing up the garage sale items, according to a source. The police chief testified that Jensen told him that he had anger issues. Quinlan asserted that Jensen made no mention of being startled by her when he initially spoke with police and admitted to killing Adara. Jensen is no stranger to the law. Back in 1995, Jensen, along with three others, were found guilty of felony theft, and he was sent to prison for three years. After a four-day trial in March of 2023, a jury deliberated for an hour and a half before finding Jensen guilty on two counts of first-degree murder. That same year, in May, Jensen was sentenced to 50 years in prison, and he will have to serve the entire sentence before he is released. The judge also gave Jensen credit for the 1,380 days he had already spent in the county jail. Iroquois County State's Attorney James Devine said, The family afterwards was very relieved and glad that this process is done as far as the court process. Jensen subsequently filed an appeal, but the details regarding the process are unavailable. Kevin Ray Underwood, behind bars for murdering a 10-year-old girl, Jamie Rose Bolin, inside of his apartment. Kevin Ray Underwood is behind bars for murdering his 10-year-old neighbor, Jamie Rose Bolin, inside his apartment in Purcell, Oklahoma. At around 3.45 p.m. on April 14, 2006, 
the FBI stopped Underwood at a checkpoint near his home and questioned him about Jamie, who had disappeared two days earlier. Underwood, who had just ended his shift at Grinders Discount Foods in Oklahoma City, spoke with agents for about an hour, and it was during that time that they became suspicious of him, according to NBC News. The then 26-year-old told detectives that he was stunned that they hadn't questioned him before. He said he was single, a loner, and had been hanging out outside for the past few weeks. But he assured them that during the time Jamie went missing, he was at home on the computer chatting with a woman. Underwood then allowed them to search his home in an effort to rule him out as a suspect. He lived at the Purcell Park Apartments in Unit 115. While Agent Craig Overby was in Underwood's bedroom, he discovered a plastic tub inside the closet. There was a lid on top of it, but it was secured with duct tape. Underwood said he could look inside, but he warned him that he would only find comic books. After lifting a corner of the tub and looking inside, over B said, there are no comic books in there. There are clothes. That's when Underwood told Overby to arrest him because Jamie's body was inside the tub and he had chopped her up. Underwood was immediately escorted outside the apartment where he was placed in handcuffs and transported to the Purcell Police Department. When Overby realized that he never saw a body, he went back inside Underwood's apartment along with several officers and opened the tub. There was a trash bag inside, and when he tore it open, he saw Jamie's face and her bicycle, which had been disassembled, and her mug was found underneath Underwood's bed. In a videotaped confession, Underwood, who had fantasies involving human torture and cannibalism, told detectives that on April 12, 2006, Jamie returned home from school. She was a fifth grade student at Purcell Intermediate School, and she was living with her dad at the same apartment complex as Underwood. Jamie went home and changed her clothes. Before leaving, she grabbed a mug and filled it with ice milk. She had it with her when she asked Underwood if she could go inside his apartment and pet his rat, Freya. He said yes. She left her bicycle outside and went inside Underwood's apartment, sat on the floor, and began petting Freya. A short while later, she and Underwood began watching an episode of SpongeBob SquarePants. As they were talking about the cartoon show, Underwood retrieved a wooden cutting board and hit Jamie on the head, which caused her to scream. As she was screaming and apologizing to Underwood over and over, he struck her several more times in an attempt to make her lose consciousness. But she still didn't. He then put his hand over her mouth and nose and tried to suffocate her, but Jamie fought the entire time. The struggle led to multiple injuries to his legs, but he continued until he thought she was, in fact, dead. As Jamie lay motionless on the floor, Overwood turned her over, and it was then that he noticed she was still breathing. He put duct tape over her mouth and nose and dragged her body to the bedroom before going outside and bringing her bicycle inside the apartment. Underwood returned to the bedroom and undressed himself before removing Jamie's clothing. He was attempting to have sexual intercourse with her because he said the killing aroused him. Due to the positioning of Jamie's body, he was unable to have any sexual intercourse with her. But he did, however, perform a brief sex act. Afterward, he moved her body to the bathroom, which he said was a struggle because of how heavy she was. Underwood wanted to quickly drain her blood before it coagulated. But by the time he got her into the bathtub, there were already blood clots. Using a decorative dagger, Underwood proceeded to saw off her head but the viscous blood was clogging the drain. His plan was to have sex with her headless body, but when the process turned chaotic, 
he decided to stop what he was doing and clean up the mess, then get rid of Jamie's body. By that time, Jamie's father had returned home from work, and he was looking for her. When Underwood stepped outside, he asked him if he had seen her, and Underwood said he hadn't. He told authorities that he tried to show that he was concerned about Jamie, so that her father wouldn't suspect him of anything. That's why he helped Jamie's family search for her until 8 p.m. When Underwood went back inside his apartment, he continued cleaning Jamie's blood. Then he put her in a plastic tub. He said it wasn't easy to do because Jamie's body was already stiff at that point. Using duct tape, Underwood was able to close the lid. An autopsy revealed that Jamie's cause of death was asphyxiation combined with direct blows to the head. After the interrogation, Underwood was arrested on first-degree murder charges. He was booked into the McLean County Jail, where he was held without a bond. In February 2008, a jury deliberated for 23 minutes before returning with a guilty verdict. They also recommended the death penalty, which the judge later approved. Two months later, Underwood was sentenced to death by lethal injection. Underwood is currently on death row at the Oklahoma State Penitentiary in McAllister, Oklahoma. Anita Hill, behind bars for the truck stop murder of her son's boyfriend, Jamie Johnson. Anita Hill is behind bars for the murder of her son's boyfriend, Jamie Johnson, which occurred at a truck stop in Tuscaloosa County, Alabama. On the evening of April 14, 2014, law enforcement officers were dispatched to a Love's truck stop on Alabama 216 near Interstate 2059 in McCullough after receiving a 911 call about a shooting. When they arrived on the scene, they found Johnson, 36, on the ground, suffering from a gunshot wound to the back. He was transported to UAB Medical West Hospital, where he was pronounced dead. Police learned through an investigation that Hill who was 51 years old at the time, had plans to meet up with her son at the gas station to talk. When she arrived, she realized that he had brought his boyfriend of four years, and that's when an argument ensued. According to the testimony of Hill's son, Johnson yelled and cursed at her, then called her a name. Some sources state that Hill knew Johnson was going to be at the gas station, and that she was planning to speak to both of them about their relationship. At some point during the conversation, Johnson turned around and attempted to walk away. It was then that Hill of Pickens County pulled out a revolver from her purse and opened fire. Hill returned to her vehicle and waited for the police to arrive. She was arrested on murder charges and booked into the Tuscaloosa County Jail where she was held on a $75,000 bond. Hill was later released after posting bail. According to 6 WBRC, Sergeant Dale Phillips with the Tuscaloosa Metro Homicide Unit said, quote, Witnesses have told us the relationship between these two individuals, the two young men, had been, at times, possibly physically abusive as well as mentally abusive. We do not see this in any nature being a hate crime. We see this as a family having issues in this. All the people involved in this were either related or had been acquainted for several years. During the trial, Hill took the stand and said she had no memory of pulling the trigger, but she said she snapped because she felt as though her son's life was in danger. Johnson did not hit or threaten Hill or her son at the time, but she said she felt that way because of their history of abuse. They had reportedly been involved in over 10 domestic violence incidents, and when Hill suggested they get substance abuse treatment, Johnson became angry. 
Hill admitted that she shot Johnson, but she said it was because she was protecting her son. She also mentioned that she wished it would have never happened. She then apologized to the victim's family. That meant absolutely nothing. Her sorry was too late, said Johnson's sister. I don't feel like she ever felt like she did anything wrong. Prosecutor Eddie Sherlock, a deputy district attorney with the Tuscaloosa County District Attorney's Office, said, quote, How can someone with their back to somebody be a threat to anyone? She intended to kill him. That gun did not accidentally go off. It was made to go off. Her defense attorney, who contended that she fired the trigger in the heat of passion, stated that he didn't know why she did it. She doesn't know why she did it. She was provoked to the point where she snapped. It's not murder, and I think you all know that. On December 8, 2016, a jury deliberated for less than an hour before they found Hill guilty of murdering her son's boyfriend. Though her defense team wanted the jury to consider the lesser charge of manslaughter, she was then handcuffed and taken into custody. Johnson's relatives stated that they were relieved when they heard the verdict. These last two years have been a living hell, knowing that she's walking the earth every day and that he couldn't, said Johnson's sister. This is the answer we were asking for and praying for. Hill's defense attorney said, I respect the jury's decision, but respectfully disagree. In January 2017, Hill was sentenced to 20 years in prison, and she was given credit for the 47 days she had already spent in jail. Robert Early, behind bars for murdering his girlfriend, Emily Lampert, following an argument during a weekend trip. Robert Early is behind bars for the murder of his girlfriend, Emily Lampert, whose body was found in a remote area of a village in Eddy County, New Mexico. Lampert, a 30-year-old elementary school teacher and mother of two, had been dating early for a few months when they decided to go on a trip to Carlsbad. They checked into a hotel room at the Best Western Stevens Inn in the 800 block of South Canal Street. On the night of March 1st, 2014, she and Early, who at the time was a 33-year-old oil field worker, had drinks at the Blue Cactus Lounge, which was a bar located inside the hotel. The following morning, Early called the Carlsbad Police Department and reported Lampert missing. He told the dispatcher that he last saw her leaving the bar alone, according to the Albuquerque Journal. Early asserted that before Lampert disappeared, she told him that she was leaving with another man who treated her right. He said Lampert was intoxicated at the time and she was wearing a really cute dress with high heels. She left her phone, purse, and identification behind, Early said. Early also contacted Lampert's family and friends and told them that she had gone missing. On March 4th, Early of Euless, Texas, confessed to murdering Lampert during an interview with law enforcement. He told detectives that while he and Lampert were at the bar, they got into an argument when another man began flirting with her. Lampert walked out of the bar, returned to their room. Early told detectives that Lampert was promiscuous, had a temper, and would often smoke marijuana. He went on to say that he followed her to the hotel room, where the arguing turned physical. Early said he beat Lampert until she lost consciousness. He then put her in his silver vehicle, a 2007 Hyundai Elantra, and drove to a remote area on County Road 31. When she regained consciousness, they began fighting again. That's when Early said he struck Lampert multiple times with an air pump before he tied a rope around her neck. 
He put the end of the rope inside his car, closed the door, drove off, dragging Lampert behind the vehicle. According to some sources, he tied the rope to his bumper. Early stopped when he reached a ranch in Loving where he left her for dead before fleeing the scene. He said he returned the following day to see if she was still alive, but Lampert had already succumbed to her injuries. He then led detectives to Lampert's body, which was found behind a barn. She was laying face down, wearing only a bra. Her clothes were found in another location. An autopsy revealed that Lampert sustained severe blunt force trauma to her head as well as scrapes, bruises, and tears. She was also alive when she had the pressure applied to her neck. Lampert's cause of death was ligature strangulation and blunt force trauma. Her ex-husband, who was now reportedly taking care of their two daughters, described her as a one-of-a-kind person. He added that she was absolutely special. There was no one like her in the world. According to a spokesperson for the Richardson Independent School District, Lampert had recently completed her first year of teaching first grade math and science at O. Henry Elementary School in Garland, Texas. She began working at the school after graduating from the University of North Texas. On March 5, 2014, Early was arrested in Carlsbad and booked into the Eddy County Detention Center where he was held on a $1 million bond. He was charged with murder, tampering with evidence, and being a fugitive from justice. Early pleaded not guilty to the charges and waived a preliminary hearing. To avoid a life sentence, the defense team asked the jury to consider finding Early guilty of second-degree murder. They contended that on that night Lampert was killed, Early had been drinking alcohol in the afternoon and well into the night. With that amount of alcohol in his system, it is their conjecture that he was incapable of planning her murder. Following a three-week trial at the Eddy County Courthouse, a jury deliberated for a few hours before they unanimously found Early guilty of first-degree murder and tampering with evidence. Early's defense attorney said, We respect the decision of the jury. In May 2015, Early was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. After his sentencing, Early spoke briefly. He said, The guilt and pain I've had since that night has been a living nightmare. He then asked Lampert's forgiveness, but he stated that he didn't expect them to forgive him, adding that he would trade places with Lampert in a heartbeat. Early filed an appeal after his attorney argued that the statements he made to the police should never have been used as evidence against him. He also claimed that the court was wrong in allowing the graphic crime scene photos and denying his request for a continuance the New Mexico Supreme Court disagreed and upheld his conviction. Star Tribble behind bars for murdering her boyfriend, Tamario Clark, while he was sleeping. Star Tribble is behind bars for murdering her boyfriend, Tamario Clark while he was sleeping at their home in Polk County, Florida. On February 22, 2016, law enforcement officers were called to Tribble's home in the 3700 block of Imperial Drive in Winter Haven. When they arrived, they discovered Clark's decomposing body on a mattress next to a bullet casing belonging to a 45 handgun, which they didn't find. Clark, 33, had been shot in the back of the head. The following day, Tribble was arrested and charged with accessory after the fact and giving a false statement. She initially told detectives that she had nothing to do with Clark's murder, and the last time she saw her boyfriend of 15 years was on February 18th, which is when she said she left her home. 
Tribble, a certified nurse assistant, stated that Clark instructed her to take their two boys, who were seven and ten at the time, as well as her then 20-year-old daughter, and leave the home for a few days. After packing some of their belongings, Tribble said she checked into a hotel a few miles away and didn't return home until the day Clark's body was discovered. When she mentioned how Clark was killed, detectives were suspicious, as they claimed to have never provided Tribble with that information. They also stated that she did, in fact, return to the home on February 19th and February 21st, because she was captured on surveillance video. Tribble admitted to returning home, but she said it was only to retrieve her work uniform. She also mentioned that she knew Clark was dead, but had no idea who may have killed him. Police learned through an investigation that when Tribble returned to her home in the early hours of February 19, 2016, she fatally shot her boyfriend while he was sleeping. The following morning, Tribble went to the gas station in Walton County, and it was there that she gave her daughter a bag and told her to throw it in the trash. According to a source, Tribble's daughter told detectives that it appeared to have contained a heavy metal object about eight inches in length. Tribble then picked up one of her friends, and they went to the Walton County Correctional Facility in Defuniac Springs, to visit a man she was supposedly dating. The next day, she drove to her brother's house in Lakeland and asked him to help her move something at her house, although he told the authorities that he had no idea what he was helping her with, he obliged. Leaving her children behind, Tribble took her brother to her house. Once there, she apprised him that Clark was in the bedroom. After he saw Clark's body, he asked Tribble why she didn't call an ambulance or the police, according to an arrest affidavit. Tribble said the authorities would have asked too many questions, and it was also reported that she confessed to shooting Clark. She said she did it because she was sick of him jumping on her. Although Tribble's daughter told authorities that she witnessed physical violence, between Tribble and Clark when she was younger. They hadn't been violent toward each other in the days leading up to his murder. When investigators listened to phone conversations between Tribble and the man she was seeing in prison, they discovered that they had, in the past, talked about killing Clark. It was alleged that when Tribble's brother refused to help her move Clark's body, they returned to his house. On the morning of February 22, 2016, Tribble's daughter was about to leave her uncle's house and head to class when she realized she left her book at her home in Polk County. As Tribble handed her the key to the house, she purportedly said, He's gone. When Tribble's daughter went back to their house, she found Clark's body and called the police. Tribble was booked into the Polk County Jail, where she was held without bond. She was later charged with first-degree murder, according to the ledger. On October 31, 2017, a Polk County jury found Tribble guilty, and a judge sentenced her to life in prison. Chelsea Watrous Cook behind bars for the murder of her ex-husband's girlfriend, Linda Belate Williams. Chelsea Watrous Cook is behind bars for murdering her ex-husband's girlfriend, Lisa Belate Williams, at his apartment home in Midville, Utah. In August 2017, Cook's former spouse filed for divorce, and five months later, it was finalized. He eventually began dating Williams, a 26-year-old teller at the bank where he worked. By the summer of 2018, Cook had allegedly begun harassing Williams, and according to the Daily Spectrum, there were confrontations at the bank, bullying on Instagram, and several phone calls. Those calls were reportedly made from Skyridge High School in Lehigh, 
where Cook had been employed as a health and yoga teacher for four years. Williams, of American Fork, was reluctant to report Cook to the police because she thought it would have made the situation harder for the children. Cook and her ex-husband had two children, twin girls, who were three years old at that time. In hindsight, I think the best thing for the kids would have been to call the police every time, said one of Williams' relatives. Williams' mother stated that she would always worry about her daughter's safety. On the night of November 25, 2018, Cook sent her ex-husband a text message. She asked him to meet her outside his apartment complex, which was located near the 7600 block of South Center Square. Cook claimed that she wanted to give him cold medicine for one of their daughters. He went outside and stood in the parking lot, but Cook was nowhere to be found. When he returned to his apartment, he realized that Cook had snuck inside, where Williams and the twin girls were decorating the Christmas tree with ornaments they had handmade. He asked her to leave, but Cook refused and locked herself in the bathroom for approximately 15 seconds. He called 911, and during that time, Cook exited the bathroom and grabbed her coat. Cook, who was 32 years old at the time, pulled out a gun and fired three to five shots at Williams, which caused her to fall on the couch. When Cook's ex-husband snatched the gun out of her hand, she sat down in a chair next to her children. As he was tending to his girlfriend, he got up and started walking toward her coat. That's when he pinned Cook against the wall and instructed their children to run to the room. He kept Cook in that position until the police arrived. Robert Ungret, a detective with the Salt Lake City Police Department, stated that at around 6.56 p.m., they received a call about a domestic disturbance, but sometime later, they received another call about a shooting. When officers arrived on the scene, they noticed Williams was suffering from two gunshot wounds to the torso. She was rushed to an area hospital where she succumbed to her injuries. Cook was arrested. She was booked into the county jail on charges of one count of aggravated murder. After her arrest, the Alpine School District terminated her employment and removed her staff page from their website. They had also learned that Cook was arrested in October 16, 2016. She was charged with domestic violence, but it didn't involve Williams. According to the attorneys in the case, Cook and her ex-husband got into an argument while he was picking up their children. It was then that she allegedly grabbed him by his hair, which caused him to fall down the stairs. She pleaded not guilty to the charge, but she failed to report it to the superintendent. It was reported that if teachers with the Alpine School District were ever arrested, they were supposed to report it within 48 hours. On November 30, 2018, Williams was buried at the Centennial Park Cemetery in Centennial Park, Arizona. According to her obituary, she was joyful and delighted in the little things. She had a green thumb and a passion for plants, especially finding and reviving the ones that were struggling. To those who knew her well, she was funny, thoughtful, philosophical, and loved to engage in meaningful conversation. Cook later admitted to fatally shooting her ex-husband's girlfriend. To avoid the death penalty, she pleaded guilty to seven charges, including aggravated murder, aggravated burglary, and committing violent offenses in front of children. In February of 2020, Cook was sentenced to 34 years to life in prison. And that, dear listeners, is going to bring a close to these True Crime Cases, Volume 9. I know it's a little short. But you've got a really special treat coming tomorrow. I would like to take a moment and give a special shout out to the reformed members of Back to Ashes. Colt Stonewolf, Inner Scare Wifey, Howler's Mom, Luz Crispin, 
Tammy Slayton, C.A.G., Denise S., Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Norma D.W., Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed these cases. Until next time, please take care of yourself. I'll be reading to you very, very soon. Peace, love, and light to you all.